you imagine as a four-year-old or a five-year-old coming to a prison for the first time and you're going to be sniffed by dogs you're going to be searched you're going to be patted down and mothers find that traumatic Hello and welcome to Locked Up Living, the podcast which looks at resilience in challenging organisations such as, but not only, prisons and hospitals for mentally ill prisoners and patients. My name is David Jones and together with Naomi Murphy, I present your Locked Up Living podcast. Hello, today we're welcoming Dr Lucy Baldwin. Lucy is a senior lecturer and researcher at De Montfort University. Lucy has worked in criminal and social justice for over 30 years, being also a qualified social worker and probation officer. Lucy's research and publications focus predominantly on the impact of imprisonment on mothers and their children. Lucy's doctoral research focused on the persisting impacts of maternal imprisonment, particularly concerning maternal identity and maternal role. Lucy gave evidence to the recent female-focused Pharma Review and the joint Human Rights Inquiry into Maternal Imprisonment and the Rights of the Child. Lucy is currently researching the supervision of mothers and trauma-informed probation practice. When Lucy published Mothering Justice in 2015, it was the first whole book in the UK to take motherhood as a focus in relation to criminal and social justice. She says, thankfully, since then the world is more interested in the topic and in the circumstances surrounding criminalised mothers and their children. Lucy has published a number of articles and book chapters and is currently working on three edited collections and two books, all related to women, mothers and justice. Lucy is a passionate and active advocate for positive change for criminalised women and would like to see a drastically reduced prison population and increased use of gender-tailored community disposals. Lucy is working closely in partnership with several organisations to provide resources and training for those working with criminalised mothers and mothers themselves. Welcome. Hi Lucy, really delighted that you're joining us today. Um, both David and I watched a recent presentation that you gave on um, on YouTube. I have to say it was I think we both found it profoundly moving and affecting actually um, to the point that it was really quite quite distressing to to watch and hear those those mm-hmm. stories. Um, so obviously we would like to go into that more, but you've actually had a very rich employment history prior to becoming an academic. So could we begin with hearing a bit about your pathway um, towards researching such a down-to-earth subject? Mm. Um, yes, thank you. I um, I started out, uh, my very first role after university actually was in a, a, a children's secure residential unit. So I worked directly with children, a, a lot of whom had parents in prison, um, but certainly were coming from families who had very difficult lived experiences, um, which actually, as had I as a child growing up, um, so there was nothing that was very unfamiliar to me really, um, it just made a change that I was on the other side of it. Um, so that, that was my first role and then after that I qualified as a social worker and for most of my social work career I um, I worked with mental health and eventually specialising in forensic mental health and was attached to um, secure psychiatric units and prisons for a time. But I did work quite across the spectrum in social work, to be fair. I did do a stint in childcare, in child and family psychiatry, um, which I really enjoyed. And um, and I did a little bit with older people and a bit with learning disabilities. So I, I kind of worked across it all, but ended up, always ended up going back to uh, mental health and forensic mental health, um, which I really loved. And how I kind of got really, I suppose the criminal justice and social work world merged for me was during my time with um, in, in secure psychiatric hospitals and units and prisons, because obviously you can't, I don't think you can ever see um, 
somebody as purely somebody who's in the criminal justice system without taking account of their you know criminogenic needs and their social justice needs you just can't separate one from the mm -hmm. other um at all and i think it was always a disaster when people tried to do that um so i think for me that was, it was very clear that the world merged and i was quite lucky in that in my day when i qualified as a social worker quite a long time ago social workers and probation officers were dual trained it was the same course so you could you could flip between the two obviously you can't now they're two very different things but at the time the probation service and social services had shared goals and shared um shared ideals and a shared ideology about about the importance of welfare so it, it was quite easy to move between the two so i moved over into probation and that was when i kind of was I suppose more exclusively working with the criminal justice system although like i said before never exclusively leaving social justice to the, to one side and i have to say as a probation officer i was really delighted to have had that mental health background and that social work background and it gave me a huge advantage i think in terms of dealing with and responding appropriately to the people who i would be supervising um and i ended up kind of building up a specialist caseload if you like of of the people on probation who all had additional needs in relation to mental health so it, it was that was kind of how it, how it happened and i i worked as a probation officer in the community but also in prisons um i worked in the high um in the high secure estate as well as in and out of the female estate so i i, loved it. I had a lovely time as a practitioner really i really really enjoyed practice i miss it a lot i always keep a foot in the door because um, I miss it. I could never be a pure academic. I was really struck, Lucy, by um, your just description of all the mental health experience that you'd had previously as a social worker and thinking that that must surely impact on um, how probation officers perform their role now with, you know, with, that, with that loss of, of that kind of background. Definitely. I don't think probation officers have enough knowledge about mental health and about its relevance in, in offending behaviour or antisocial behaviour. And, and I, you know, I would say by far the majority of people who I dealt with as a probation officer had mental health needs, absolutely, undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the ways that I found my background really, really helped me was because I found it much easier to engage a multi-agency approach with people. So if I had somebody who had additional needs, then I would make sure that I would make the referrals or work with the psychiatrist or the psychologist or, 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 or uh, be part of the CPA, the care programme approach, which most probation officers know nothing about. And I would, I would kind of set them up and and say look we need to be part of this and probation needs to be part of this because we see this person every single week um but yet we weren't routinely included mm -hmm. so i think having that experience and that background was absolutely invaluable to my practice and on more than one occasion it made a huge difference to the outcomes um for the people who i was working with i can really imagine really imagine that and i was also curious about what it was that drew you to forensic practice because forensic is a bit kind of marmite isn't it people either kind of like love or hate that the work and it does come with its own unique challenges <laughs> <laughs> i really like marmite so i do um i think it, it probably started at, at the very beginning at the at the secure young people center mm -hmm because I could see the trajectories that some of the young people were on and, and it was really difficult to see how, how some of those trajectories could be interrupted and, and I found that really challenging because it was like if these young people had more support for their mental health issues and their social justice issues then so often we could have avoided them becoming criminalised and so I think that was probably where the seeds were sown in terms of my interest but I just absolutely loved the work I found it fascinating rewarding frustrating heartbreaking I loved everything about it I thoroughly enjoyed my role as both a social worker and a probation officer and the mental health more, most of all most of all it's really interesting that you refer back to that work with young people as well because I think one of the um, tips that we to try and give to people working with people who've committed horrendous offences is to try and find the child part in them that hurt child and I wonder whether having that grounding in the in the work with the young people meant that that there was a life of it was easier to see that that part of the person than when you're when you're met with people who've committed um, serious crimes 
Definitely, I think that's absolutely true. And you know, when it when when it is literally the child, it it is much easier to do, I suppose, in some ways. And I I do remember this one young man come coming in who'd committed a really violent assault against his mum, including a, a, a serious sexual assault against his mum. And you know, but he still came in as a child, and he still needed that that hug. And, and it was there was no way we would have got anywhere with that young man if we'd not responded to the child in him, if we'd only responded to him as this person who committed these you know heinous offences, but he had to be responded to as the young boy he was, you know, and he was a very young boy. And I never found that a challenge. And I have to say that even when I worked in the adult estate and I worked in HMP Franklin with, you know, as you know, people who have committed really serious, uh, monstrous offences, as the media would label them, but I've never found it a challenge to to engage with anybody and, and to see them as a person over and above what they've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, invaluable. And so you, you've subsequently then um, got involved in researching um, what it's like to be a parent or specifically a mother in prison um, or mothers that are in contact with the criminal justice system. How, how did you end up coming to be involved in that, deciding that would be something that would be really fruitful to, to explore? What, what was, what's I your story? It's a difficult one in some ways because I, did, I don't think until I got involved in the research that I realised just how closely aligned the topic was to me on so many different personal levels. And I always remember reading something by Alison Lieblin and, and she'd written something about the, the topics that we choose for research are never coincidental. You know, the curiosity is always triggered by something personal. And, and reading that was almost like a light bulb moment for me. And I'd had... a, a, a quite a, di a difficult childhood, a, a very difficult childhood. I'd left home very young and I actually had my first child when I was 16. Um, and I got pregnant only a couple of weeks after coming out of hospital after a serious suicide attempt actually, um, when I was 15. And, and being a mother and being a young single mother in the 80s was really quite challenging. Um, because there was there was always that assumption that you were I mean Ma Margaret Thatcher God rest her soul actually used to call us the scourge of society and blamed us for you know the the, the fall of society and and all of the disenfranchised youth and all of the rest of it and and and, it, and I remember very keenly that stigma and it had a profound impact on me being a young mum um, even though for most for the most part when I was a young mum I wasn't always single I had a a very lovely partner my children had a very lovely dad um but there was that perception you know it was always there i remember trying to dress older when i went out i remember you know always trying to convince people that i could do it so motherhood was so important to me not only from my perspective of, of not having been i suppose very positively mothered but also knowing that motherhood for me was the thing that motivated me saved me probably and it was it was central to my core and so i think there was that combined with all of my experiences in social work and probation where i'd watched all of these really resilient powerful strong women mothering through the most awful circumstances and and continuing to really mother well and put their children first in in circumstances that some people would could just not even imagine and i think it was a combination of all of those things that i felt like i'd found I'd found a peaceful place that, that, that meant a lot to me, that I was passionate about, that I knew I could make a difference and that the passion would never go. It would be a lifelong thing. It wouldn't be something that I would research for a short period and then move on to something else. For me, this is my life's work. It's, and it's interesting to hear about how your life is woven into that in the in the way that you describe it. I was actually thinking about that quite recently because I, I'm an unmarried mother in my 40s, but I had my child at, at 40. And I remember thinking I would never have done that in my 20s because of the shame and stigma that would be associated with it. Mm -hmm. Our attitudes have changed so much, haven't they, in terms of Definitely. mothers. But it's quite difficult now for people to imagine what it was like yes. but it, it really was challenging and it's, I mean I think I've said before that I was offered um, when I was pregnant I got very fat and I couldn't wear my rings and I was offered a ring when I went to hospital to have my baby because the nursing staff kept a box of wedding rings on the ward wow. for girls like me I quote 
gosh. But there is something about the role of mother that does attract particular judgment, isn't there? And um, people feel free to castigate and um, make... I suppose tar and feather is, is often feel what it sometimes feels like. So it might not be about being a single parent these days, but actually mothers in prison, um, I'm sure, bring a particular particular load of judgments to to the to if you're a woman and you've ended up in prison and you're a mother as well at the same time absolutely and i think you're right in that motherhood attracts a, a, a unique level of judgment and a unique level of expectation um different to fatherhood different to any other role that i think exists you know it's a universally accepted notion that a mother will automatically and naturally um, put her children first, meet all of their needs, she'll be selfless, she'll be loving, she'll be nurturing, she'll be good. Above all, she'll be good because mothers are supposed to be good. And I think that pressure on women is, is present for everybody. I mean, you know, women who are not criminalised, we feel guilty if we work too much, if we don't work too much, or, you know, we feel guilty if, we, if we've got them too much for Christmas and not enough for Christmas. You know, I think it, guilt is synonymous with motherhood, but with criminalised motherhood, it's a huge, huge hook to hang bad motherhood on. And as women, I think we're already very hard on ourselves as mothers, but as criminalised women, women are very, very hard on themselves, and yet there's an expectation in the end that they're not. Because because there's always that phrase, well, if they thought about the kids before, they wouldn't, did, they wouldn't have done it. And every single woman I've ever met who's gone into the criminal justice system, somebody at some point in the system has said that to her. I tell you, every single woman, somebody has said that to her. And, and that in itself is an immediate accusation. It's an immediate judgment. And the women feel that shame and stigma in a completely different layer. So motherhood adds a huge and significant layer of layer of complexity to already complex needs for, for women in prison. And I think it was Corston, it was Baroness Hale actually, who, who was quoted by Corston as saying that any mother who goes to prison is deemed a bad mother. And I think that I think that remains true. That does remain true. There is that perception. Yeah, absolutely. And can you give us a picture of the range of women that you're referring to in your research? Oh, I had the I had quite a diverse bunch um, actually across all of my research projects. And the the one thing that they've all had in common is their resilience. That, and that is probably, in some ways, one of the only things they had in common, um, apart from their motherhood. But I've, uh, in, in the doctoral research particularly, I had mothers who, who ranged from 19 to, I think, 68 was my oldest mum. So I had young mums who were sentenced for a first offence. Um, I had older mums who were sentenced for more serious offences. I had a couple of lifers. I had several grandmothers in the research. I had um, women from lots of different cultural backgrounds, um, and all of which was relevant, all of which intersected with their motherhood in quite specific ways, um, particularly grandmotherhood. You know, that was a very layered um, experience for, for grandmothers who went to prison, who felt they were judged not only as mothers, but also as grandmothers. And they were deeply affected as grandmothers, as well as, as mothers. Others. Um, and I think that brought my research is probably um, it's not something that, that is very present in research the experiences of grandmothers in prison um, it, they're kind of kind of lumped in with mothers and, and they do have very distinct and specific needs um, and I think that was quite a significant finding really um, but but the mothers themselves were desperate all of them to um, associate with each other um out of the 12 prisons in england 10 of our prisons 10 of our women's prisons are closed prisons and one of my views one of my findings actually is just how unjust that is because you know most women in prison over 80 percent of women in prison are in prison for non-violent offenses um so they there's there's little justification for the closed um, nature of the prison which brings with it additional restrictions in terms of contact with children um how that contact takes place how how well the women are able to interact with each other or not and and to me it's 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 completely unnecessary given the women's level of risk that we have mm -hmm. so many closed prisons in the women's estate um, and that really impacted on the women's ability to engage with each other as mothers 
because if they were in closed prisons, they were far more reluctant to ask questions about childhood or children because they didn't know the mother's circumstances, so they'd be frightened about triggering um, issues that might cause self-harm, or you know they didn't know if mothers were had their children in their care or whether they or whether they would get them back, so they would be nervous about asking those questions. But in the open prisons, the mothers told me very very clearly that they spent most of their time talking about their children, walking around the grounds, you know, going into each other's rooms to look at photographs and, and spending time speaking about motherhood and the motherhood role, which kept them engaged in that role as well. So it, that, it, that was really significant, I think, the environment that the mothers were in. And it's really interesting to hear about, I suppose, the diversity and range of those experiences, but also how, how central it was. So it's... Um really interesting what you've just been saying about the uh, uh, female prison estate because the kind of stereotype in my mind was that almost all the female prisons were much lower security than the men's so so even though I visited uh, a number of them and they offer the same problems getting in and out as any other prison you come across but, mm. I, and but I, think it, that, I think that's a common misconception and I think you know, people don't realise that the female estate inherits a lot of its rules and regulations from the male estate. So the, the rules are almost blanket across the estate and they get applied to women when they shouldn't be. And some of the prisons that, we, that are women's prisons are redesigned or, or re-rolled men's prisons. They were originally men's prisons, so they carry the same um, category. And they ca But women aren't held in the same way that men are. So men are, you know, categorised as cat A, cat B, cat D, whatever. Women aren't categorised like that. So women aren't necessarily held in a closed prison because of their level of risk they're accommodated often um on the basis of the ministry of justice needs on the prison estate needs rather than the needs or the risk level of the women so you can have a woman who's only in prison for shoplifting but she might spend her whole sentence in a closed prison or she might flip between the two and it has so much less to do with her risk level and her offense level than it does with the needs of the prison which is yeah. outrageous actually i think and I guess they're also often a lot further away from home as a consequence, so a lot harder for their children to get to see than if you're in a, if you're in, in for shoplifting in a local prison in the middle of a city centre might be more accessible, might it? If, Absolutely. But... Most women are between 60 and 100 miles away from home, but very mm. often it's more than that. You know, there are obviously there are no women's prisons on the Isle of Wight or in Wales, so some women travel an awful long way. And if women are in closed prisons, because of some of the differences in some of the prisons, and again, it's not consistent, which is com com very confusing and complicated for women to understand because different prisons have different rules. But in a closed prison, you're more likely to not be allowed physical contact with your child. So you might be allowed a, an initial hug, but the child would not necessarily be allowed to sit on your knee and you wouldn't be allowed to get out of your seat to go and play with that child. So very often children will go and play in the play area in the corner and the mums are sitting watching their children playing with other children and they're not actually engaging with them. And many mothers find that too difficult and too hard, particularly the no contact. So if they're far away and you know the children have, have taken an awful long time to get there they're already fractures sometimes mothers decide not to have any visits because they're too hard so they actually lose that really important contact with their children importantly their children lose that bond like that contact with their mothers and that has an enormous impact on the quality of their relationships during the period of imprisonment but significantly post release too but mothers will make those decisions which which they th they think and they you know argue in their own heads are decisions based on the on the best interests of their children and and also almost a self protection to protect themselves from the the challenge of visits because I mean one mum told me her her little girl had fallen down in a visit she wasn't allowed out of her seat to go and pick up this child and this little this was a toddler I mean this baby was only about two years old and the mum tried to get up the officer had pushed her down and said no you can't get up and this mum was really utterly traumatized by that and she said to me she, she said that state sanctioned abuse I wasn't allowed to go and comfort my child and if I was outside and a social worker was watching that I would be deemed neglectful but in here, that's permitted, in fact, enforced. And I couldn't argue with her. She was exactly right. You know, 
It's really hard to hear those stories because it's like the the desire for vengeance on the woman who's committed a crime seems to trump the needs of the child within that scenario and yet actually the child surely is the person that should be important oh, you know that should come above our wish for vengeance for time. absolutely and, and you're going to be think, sniffed by you know, dogs you're going to be searched you're going to be patted down and mothers find that traumatic you know i had one mother who would not allow her children to visit because her child's nappy had been searched during a visit and she just thought she could not bear that and she couldn't understand her, her one of her children had said you know mommy why why did they look in 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 molly's nappy you know you've told us nobody's allowed to to look at those parts why did this stranger look in molly's nappy and this mother was so traumatized by that experience that she actually said no more no more visits and she wouldn't have any visits at all and and i think you're right you know the needs of the children have to be more accounted for they have to be paramount really i mean obviously it's far better if we send far fewer women to prison um particularly those who are mothers of dependent children but if we must persist in sending people to prison the way that we currently do then we have to get better at managing that situation for children and, and for and for mothers because and fathers actually because you know children visit their fathers too and and you know that whole that whole experience need not be a horrific or as horrific as it can be currently I'm really reminded of that conversation about children seen and heard on online where there'd been posts about children being able to see their parents in prison and actually the amount of trolling that came and you know we're talking about children here and yet certain sections of society felt free to vent their anger and disgust and contempt and these were children you know innocent children within that absolutely it's outrageous it's bizarre how people people can other people who are criminalized and that that othering applies to their children you know the media don't think twice about publishing street names and addresses of criminalized people and those, the children live in those houses you know the children live there too and they can be identified from things that are published and it, it's i think how 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 we tarnish children um who were children of criminalized parents is is just abhorrent it's awful and good on children heard and seen for doing the work that they do to try and challenge that and, and make a difference and i think that the the number of people who do this trolling are relatively small and uh, and yet what they say and what they do is amplified either by social media or by the press or whatever and I think you put across your descriptions of these situations brilliantly Lucy with so much color and with so much vigor and uh, I think if most of the population had the kind of understanding of the uh, experience as you describe it they'd be really powerfully uh, moved by it I think you're right. I mean, Hoff and Roberts undertook some research, and I think it was 2012, that looked at the, the general public's perception of punishment. And, and people might start up here somewhere. But if you give people information about why we need to punish people differently or why or what good rehabilitation should look like then they found that people would you know that their opinions would would change and their opinions would reduce exactly the way that you've said uh, and i think i think it is about education and understanding but unfortunately there's a lack of will sometimes to um to understand when it comes to people who are criminalized i mean i have a bit of a sick hobby in that um I, I, I like to read the comments section in the Daily Mail and, and just because I, I want to see the kinds of things that, that people are writing about because I think in this world, in this work, you, you, we end up being surrounded at conferences and in, at events with like-minded people. So we forget that that's not, that's not the actual perception of a lot of people. So I do this stick hobby thing and remind myself of what what of, of how many people i still have to convince that we need to change things and i'm very rarely disappointed there's always streams and streams of things that i that i sit and rant at and swear at and get really angry at but and and i if if they printed their addresses i would write to them i'd go around and hammer on the door and say this is not what you think but you know yeah i think people would change their opinion if they knew more if they understood more well, thank you for doing that on our behalf, Lucy. But uh, 
look after your own health as well. <laughs> so can I ask you, you often refer to maternal identity in your work. Can you can you say a little bit about what you're meaning by that? I think a, a maternal identity is kind of it's 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 almost like an internal and an external identity. There's the identity that we talked earlier about, all of the pressures on what a good mother should be. And, you know, women are bombarded with with images of, of mothers and children. And, and you know, you can't, you can't pick up a paper or a, a reality magazine or such, such as like without somebody saying, oh, I've fallen in love with my child. I've never been more in love. And, you know, th there's that aspect of maternal identity that, that is almost external but then I think there's the internal that can be conflicting and it's like yes I love this child passionately yes I'm a mother first and I always will be but it's very hard uh, you know it's a very hard job um, but it, but I think for most women who are mothers it is the biggest part of their identity and it's the one that they see the rest of the world through that maternal lens so you know when you're a mum you, you you kind of think oh the weather's nice but you think oh the weather's nice but i can get the washing out for the kids or i can you know i can take them to the park or i can do this or or if if you are suddenly in a situation that's very dangerous if you're a mother your first thought mo most mothers first thought isn't for themselves it's for their children so it kind of becomes the lens through which you see the rest of the world you see it as a mother first and i do this exercise when i'm doing training with probation officers or prison officers and say like you know list all of the things all of the identities that we have you know we're a sister we're a we're an auntie we're a teacher we're a psychiatrist we're you know we're all of these things list them all um and then i ask people to put them in a hierarchy and invariably the women who are mothers will put mother first and i think that really illustrates just how significant a role it is to mothers and yet when we send women to prison we almost ask them to suspend that identity because the identity of prisoner supersedes everything else it supersedes you know women sometimes it supersedes women and all the other but but we ask them to suspend that maternal identity and i think it's an identity that we can't suspend because even women who have lost their children to local authority care or the children have died or they don't have their children in the care anymore they will always be a mother they will always identify as a mother and feel like a mother and think like a mother and so there's never a space where you're not a mother first but the but the the idea of um one's identity as a mother so you must be extremely nuanced so there'll be a good mother a bad mother a cross mother a kind mother a thoughtful mother and so it must be the nuances which um, are affected by particular situations like being imprisoned definitely and i think we're all all of those things <laughs> probably sometimes in one whole day but when mothers are in prison the, their own perception of themselves as a bad mother is really quite profound and they will most mothers whether they whether they're demonstrate it or not or reveal it to people around them or not most mothers will have an internal guilt and an internal shame about the fact that they're criminalized i mean i've had mothers speak to you know say to me that the minute that they set foot in uh, in a prison they immediately knew they were a bad mother um and 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 you know that women talk about that all the time if i had a penny for every time a woman had said to me i'm the worst mother in the world because i'm here i'd be a rich woman that phrase is used so often because women are measuring themselves against non-criminalized women they're measuring themselves against non-criminalized mothers so they are less than and that feeling is really quite profound and it's really quite harmful to women because if that's left to fester without challenge or support then that that creates internal damage and trauma that damages that maternal identity but that has a deep impact then on how that mother then is motivated or rehabilitated or can engage in the services around her because for example if you've got a mother who is also a mother who's addicted now happy people don't become addicted most women who are addicted are addicted because of trauma so you've got a mother who's already been traumatized she's already got traumatic experiences now she's criminalized now she's separated from her child that that's huge layers of guilt that she's going to pile on herself and sometimes when that guilt is so big it kind of manifests 
as you know, through self-harm, through suicidal ideas, through um, punishment, through... Pun I call, a lot of my mums called it penance. They felt they had a penance to serve for their children. And it affected the way they um, they were able to engage with their children during prison and release, but it also affected the way they were able to desist from offending because so much negative emotion, if you've already got an addiction, well, you know the cycle is going to be that the only way to cope with all of that negative emotion is to use your coping mechanism of addiction or self-harm which then detracts from engagement and detracts from motivation to desist and, and, and motivation to engage in rehabilitative processes. So it's huge. It's so relevant. It's so huge. My own, um, my own doctorate research was actually on shaming new parents. And I interviewed men and women for that. And every one of the mothers, none of the fathers spoke about their shame, actually. But all of the mothers spoke about shame because they were living up to this ideal of a mother and comparing themselves against this yardstick that they could never possibly attain. And so they were quite a lot of profound experiences of shame, even within a non-criminalised um, sample of, of mothers. So I can only begin to imagine the shame that's there for women that, that see themselves as failing on all these other yardsticks as well at the same time. Yeah, no, you, you're absolutely right. It's huge. The stigma and shame and guilt were uh, huge in all of all of my research. Even even if they were um, sentences that were for really minor offences, or even sometimes offences where mothers still maintained their innocence, or you know, or or, or they'd not had any control over, it, like mothers who had been forced into um, taking drugs into prison by abusive partners, their their shame was still theirs even though, and their anger was still at them. So even though most of the women who I saw, if not all of them, there were many, many multiple missed opportunities from multiple agencies, agencies to support the women before they came to prison, they were never angry at them. Their anger and shame wasn't directed at society for failing them or, or, or the government for not funding the services and resources that would have made a difference. Their anger and shame was completely internal and often directed and labelled around motherhood. So what were the main takeaways from your research, Lucy? <sighs> oh, I, I think that, I suppose, fundamental, for the um, from an umbrella perspective, it was just how harmful maternal imprisonment is to both mothers and children and just how deeply, deeply long lasting it is. Because a lot of my women were decades post release. One woman was 46 years post release and she was still having PTSD symptoms. Mm -hmm. She was still having trauma. And that wasn't the trauma that she went to prison with. This was another layer of trauma that was caused by that physical separation and the trauma of being a mother in prison. And I think the fact that you know, we recognise there's a lot of talk about trauma-informed practice and there's a lot of work going on about trying to work support women better to deal with the trauma that they brought into prison. But there's very little spoken about in terms of the trauma that's created by the criminal justice system, by imprisonment and by the struggles that women go through post-release. And that was really evident in my research, that relationships were, were damaged or were changed forever not just for a little bit of time post-release, but forever. And, and things would take women by surprise. So, for example, I had one mum who, her daughters had real difficulty accepting her, her prison sentence and that she'd gone to prison as a mother, so much so that at the point on one visit, when the mum had said to her daughter, oh, I love you, and the daughter had said, don't, don't ever tell me you love me. You don't love me because if you loved me, you would never have put me in. You would never have put yourself in this situation where you could be separated from me. And that absolutely broke this mother's heart. It really did. But she spent a long, long time building up the relationship, re-establishing that relationship, bonding through um, her daughter growing up after she was released. And they had an established positive relationship that felt like they'd, they'd moved on somewhat. And then, you know, women like this mother and other mothers like her their daughters would have babies their daughters would then become mothers and then the worst judge of mothers are other mothers i don't know if you've ever been at the school gates but you can see it it's all there um and and as as her daughter became a mother was a whole new layer of judgment i'm a mother now i can't understand how you risk this how did you do that so all of that anger comes back 
which in, which triggers all of the shame in the mother, which triggers actual PTSD in the mother because of you know what she thought she'd gone through and she'd put it and and then the flashbacks start again and the trauma is triggered. And I had other mums who the grandmothers had been to prison, but their grandchildren didn't know anything about it. So there would be family conversations going on, and grandchildren would ask innocent questions like, "Granny, where, what did you do for your twenty first? And the granny would be instantly transported back to a painful place because she had been in prison. So she was then having to lie to her grandchildren, which triggers a whole new layer of shame, which then affects her. And grandmothers would say to me, I don't actually, I try not to get so close to my children because I don't want to have those conversations. So they're actually distancing themselves from their children and grandchildren so that they, these conversations are not triggered. You know, the impact is profound and intergenerational and long lasting really hear that and also the sense of your sense of passion and outrage at the shame that people are left carrying and holding so no matter how short the sentence I guess that this impact can potentially impact the rest of, of someone's life absolutely and not just between mothers and children but between siblings you know and we don't always talk about that but particularly if you've got a mum who's got a baby on an mbu very often she might have had to have made a sophie's choice and go to an mbu miles and miles away from home and which means that the children on the outside can't then visit which that alters the relationship between siblings because the siblings are jealous of the baby, you know, or, or sometimes you have children who have within one family, there might be more than one father and those children might be split up between different homes. You know, I had one mum whose, whose siblings didn't see each other for the whole of her prison sentence and they never again were close, whereas before her prison sentence they were really close. You know, or you get situations where mums might might be as told you can have one phone call. If you've got four children, how do you choose who to phone? If you've got five children, how do you have them all on a purple visit video call when you're only allowed four people? You know what I mean? These are the really difficult things that happen that have a long term impact on families because the memories of that, the memories of those decisions are traumatic. Yeah, it's really heartbreaking. It is yeah it is in terms of um you've got you know you've got massive experiences as a social worker a probation officer an academic all this contact and hearing all these stories of people's lives you must have some pretty clear ideas about what's needed to improve the situation can you can you tell us about any of those ideas can something constructively be done <laughs> i think i mean i think first the gatekeeping has to be got, has to be better. I mean, it, it, it depends. Let, let's pretend we've got a magic wand. So if we had a magic wand, we need better social justice. You can't have effective criminal justice without effective social justice. So we need a more equitable society, full stop. We need a different society where women's needs are met earlier, sooner, more deeply, more appropriately. And, and so that's, that's, you know, starting at the top. We, we need to start at the top. But after that, we need, we need a gender-informed criminal justice system at every stage in terms of policing in terms of the courts um in terms of the prison and in terms of probation so we have to we have to get better at, at, at responding to the needs of of women who who enter the criminal justice system but best of all is we prevent women coming into the criminal justice system at all and by do, in doing that we need to resource community options we need to make sure that sentences are accountable sentences are accountable um in their decision making processes um because all of the recommendations are that magistrates must stick to there are existing guidelines called the bangkok rules which um, guide magistrates, and it is mainly magistrates who sentence women, um, who, that guide magistrates when, when a woman is a mother of dependent children or a pregnant woman, there's supposed to be this balancing exercise that weighs up um, the purpose of punishment and the severity of punishment against the needs of the children. We know from research that that doesn't happen consistently, not as often as it should. And there are some fantastic magistrates who work in gender, um, gendered tailored courtrooms in an informed way with with multiple agencies but we also know there are areas where that doesn't happen and magistrates are less likely to do that we need that to be more consistent because that alone if if sentences were more consistent um and were, were made more aware and were supported in their decision making um then we could almost have the female prison population <laughs> overnight um and i think part of that is 
again resourcing the probation service to make sure that any woman sentenced with um, dependent children has a full PSR, not an on the on the day oral report in court, but a full pre-sentence report that outlines her needs, her pathway into offending, her, pa her pathway out of offending, what the impact of the custodial sentence would be on her children, where the children would go, and importantly, what the community options were, are as an alternative to prison and how that would work because magistrates have said in research in the past that one of the reasons they do sentence to prison is they're not always aware of the community options that are available and how that would work and so i think filling those gaps to assist magistrates to make better and more consistent decisions is really important but before that there are diversion schemes that some areas do really well like um Corn, Devon and Cornwall and Plymouth, Newcastle, Manchester. There are some fantastic diversion schemes that when presented with a woman who has committed an offence, they look at that offence and look at the context and say, what was the pathway into this? What are the issues? Does she have addiction issues? Is she in poverty? Is she in an abusive relationship? And for six months, they'll work with that woman from a multi-agency perspective to address those needs. If that woman engages during that period of time, then the prosecution, the prosecution isn't proceeded with and the woman has access to lots of support, she's diverted away from the criminal justice system and she's living a better life. Obviously it's not a magic one but she's got access to, to support that she didn't previously have and then doesn't come into the criminal justice system. So they, those are the ways in which we can prevent women coming to prison. Um, I think we're a long way off um, abolition for, for, um, but I think for me there has to be a parallel approach because we have to accept, I think, well, we don't have to accept, but it's likely that we're not going to get rid of prisons overnight. They're not going to close them down for women. Um, so we have to make sure that what we do with women when they're in prison is better than, is better, gets better, and that it meets women's needs, particularly women, mothers' needs, and particularly children of, of parents in prison, so that we can we can do what we do better. So it's a two-pronged attack. I think it's, it's stopping women coming to prison, but then when they are in prison, it's looking after them better while we have them, and making sure that support follows post-release for a long time. And that, as we're talking, I suppose I'm reminded of, during the 90s, those disturbing, you know, disturbing stories about women pregnant women from prison going to give birth in shackles in hospitals and wondering what happens to people who become mothers whilst they're in prison at the moment and whether things have moved on from that mm, well yes and no tragically we've had three babies die in the last three years two have died in prison cells um, during a cell birth and one on the way to hospital we know that from um, research that around about one in ten pregnant women um, start their labor in their cells or, or, or are likely to give birth in cell so whilst there's been some progress and there should never be a woman who is in shackles while she's given birth we do know that there are some women who have been handcuffed through labor and they're handcuffed to antenatal appointments and they're handcuffed during scans. That shouldn't happen, but we know we know it still does sometimes. There's new guidance due out um, in relation to how the prison service deals with women who are pregnant and women who, who um, are due to give birth while they're in prison and how to respond to them when they've had their babies in the hope that some of the awful practices that have gone on all too recently are ceased. Uh, and, you know, and we shouldn't have situations where we have pregnant women who are hungry, who are going to bed hungry or who are going to bed on an uncomfortable mattress or who have been denied access to breast pads. But tragically, we still do have those situations. We still do have those situations. They are slowly but surely being addressed. And there's more of a will, I think, to address those issues than there ever has been. Um, and prisons are very responsive to working with organisations like Birth Companions and with myself and with women in prison um, to address some of those issues. I've, I'm doing some work with Sodexo at the minute and, and they, are, they have been really, really responsive in terms of me saying, look, this is still happening, this cannot happen. And they go, no problem, we'll sort it. And it's been sorted. So I've got no doubt there's a will that there hasn't it's been before. It's good to hear that bit of hope yeah. in there. <laughs> There is. So, Lucy, when, when I don't know how Naomi does it, but when I start to put questions together in order to provide some sort of framework for a conversation like this, I often go to the research and then end up 
drafting rather dry sorts of research related questions but actually it's the power of the narrative which you've given us already which makes the uh, the impact so thanks very much for that and we've been able to see really how each of the situations of the women that you've been describing is a distinct and powerful tragedy in its own right and we can't help wondering how you look after yourself when you're immersed in these narratives all the time. I think because I've been doing it a long time and I think be, having, having a practice background I think really helps. Um, having, um, having good colleagues, good friends, good children <laughs> I think it all it all helps and and I think but most of all is I think the passion for change I, I think it fires me and the women you know I couldn't ever I couldn't ever not do something because there's always something that can change there's always something that can happen that makes that makes things better and even if it's just something small so those small changes mean the world to me i did a presentation to prison uh, probation officers last week um to do some training and in one of the comments at the side one of the probation officers wrote i'm already a changed officer and it's things like that that just mean the world because i know that that probation officer will go into practice and will ask a woman that she's supervising about her children which sometimes never happens so she might see she might supervise hundreds of women during her career she's a, you know a newly qualified probation officer she's going to ask them all and it's things like that that really make the difference to me it, it it matters and and when when people tell me things like that how could i not cope how could i not just be okay it, it, yeah, it's that theme of activism keeps coming up in interviews actually that a lot of people that we've interviewed are really quite dissatisfied I guess with how the system is and really want change but that sense of using their energy in a constructive way to try and fight for, for something to be different seems to be really absolutely. key to helping people cope. That was so important to me and, and I don't think it's always present in academia because in academia, particularly around PhDs, there's almost this preciousness and secrecy about your research and oh, you can't tell anybody about it too soon because what if somebody pinches your ideas and you know, there's all this very bizarre um, attitude to, to doctor research but for me, I felt from day one that I had a responsibility to start shouting about things that needed to be changed for the women I couldn't sit on something for a few years and say well, well actually the last few years this has been happening and I've done nothing about it and you know I could never have done that and I think research activism is so important and I think academia really has to catch up with that because particularly in feminist research, I mean it's a fundamental part of feminist research and it be no surprise to, for, for people to hear that I'm a feminist researcher but activism is a, and challenge is a fundamental part of feminist research and I think we have a huge responsibility as, as researchers to to make sure that that is an absolute part of all of our research. Brilliant thank you is there anything we've missed out anything else you want to say Lucy? Yeah, I don't know. It's difficult for me to think. Cause it's difficult for me to think about what we've said because sometimes I feel like I just I just have a rant. But um, I I I just think it's I just think it's so important. It's it's so so important for the mothers to be heard. And I think one of the things that I'm proudest of in 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 my doctoral thesis in the actual big book itself and it was very big um was when somebody read it and she said to me it feels like it's been done with the women it's their voices and your voices together in this and i love that and i think that's the important thing is to make sure that whenever we're trying to do something for people that we do it with people and that their voices are involved in that and that women who have gone through the criminal justice system are part of the processes of change at every level at ground level but also at policy practice and management level because that that that's where they can shape things and make things different for people coming behind them great thank you very much Yeah, that was brilliant. Really, um, really um, very powerful, uh, Lucy. That's, you know, the, the, those stories do really come through in um, how you talk about 
your work and you know it's sad that it's that situation um it's hard to do justice to the emotion of it all really no it, it, it does and i you know i'd be lying if i if i said i hadn't cried many 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 tears you know with the women uh, you know i ran a mother's program in prison and honestly all of us were in tears every week but by the end of it you know the the bond the women had with each other and the the changes that had occurred in them were just amazing it was it was phenomenal really there wasn't a dry eye in the house on the last day okay thank you thank, thank you, you for inviting me it was really good to talk to you both I hope I didn't just rant. Oh, do no, you? no, you didn't. You didn't just rant. It was really, really, it was really interesting and informative. But yeah, you can't, you know, it's heartbreaking to hear, hear um, about your research. That was such a powerful conversation and just, you know, took me back again to watching Lucy's um, talk on YouTube actually that felt so emotive um, that it was actually quite difficult to stay with the, the subject when you put yourself in that in that position and I, I suppose I was really struck by how traumatizing how the potential for being so traumatizing imprisonment is and whilst the prison service is you know rightly wishing to develop trauma-informed ways of of working that's no good if the very system itself is is causing harm and being trauma-informed has to start with making criminal justice less traumatic in itself i think really yeah you put that uh, very well um as, as did lucid there's something extremely damaging about the very basic system so whatever you apply on top of that in terms of therapy or treatment programs uh, is going to have a minimal kind of effect. I, I, um, I was struck at the beginning when she was describing the difference to her working practice in the latter stages of a pr probation officer to how it is now and I kept thinking what happened to joined up practice? I mean how many reports have there been about abuse, deaths, deaths in care, which stress the importance of professions working together and sharing information and how poorly that's still done. It's quite shocking. You know, the whole thinking behind systems theory generally, isn't it, is about not looking at things in isolation. And whilst that's you're highlighting that in terms of the individual's case but also that that need to look at things from a systemic point of view is also there in terms of the fact that children ultimately are being denied the, um, the re relationship with their parents that they need and you know so long as the focus is only on that single person who's um, broken the law that we're there's this risk of other people being quite damaged within the process Many thanks again to all of you who have listened to our Locked Up Living podcast. Feel free to mention this to your friends and to your colleagues and give us feedback on our webpage lockeduplives.com and our Twitter account Locked Up Living. Many thanks too to Pete and Rach who kindly allowed us to use their music. You have called me Courage and this is available from all the usual outlets.